So, yes, I'm a uh, professor in the Department of Special Education, and my research is very much uh, aligned uh, with that position because I'm interested in the professional development of individuals that work with individuals with autism spectrum disorders across the lifespan. And I um, became very interested in implementation science when I heard a presentation by Dean Fixen, and he uh, was the director of the National Implementation Research Network, and they reviewed several disciplines, uh, any that have applied work, so education, social work, engineering, um, psychology, etc., and found that there was a consistent finding in their research review that information alone or training, no matter how well done, does, is not an effective implementation method. So in other words, no matter how entertaining I am here at SDSU or how well I deliver the content information to my students, it doesn't mean that the next day they're going to go into the school classrooms and apply what I have done um, and do that well. It's, that is just the didactic training. What is necessary is to have some coaching in the context or in the classroom uh, as they start to apply the skills. And you need a good coach, someone that knows how to do the practices well, and then also someone that has the interpersonal skills to provide that information. I decided then with a couple of, uh, three of my master's students that we would add to this literature and prove this yet again. So we focused on the paraprofessionals that work with the with preschool teachers and um, we had a what would be considered ideal workshop for the paraprofessionals. We invited them to campus. We, I provided a lecture on how to use certain practices with students with autism spectrum disorders. We provided information from research articles. We had them role play with their with the uh, the teachers. We then brought in some of the students, um, children of my colleagues, and they practiced or had behavioral rehearsal. So we know by the time they left that day-long workshop, they were able to do the skills well. And then we looked at and saw what happened when they were back, went back into the classroom. And I have one example here of Danny. So you can see that this was the baseline um, performance of, of the practice, and it's pretty low, both in a, a free choice activity and also on the playground. Danny was our superstar at the workshop. He really showed that he could do the practice very well. Um, but then you see a very typical pattern of what happens in context, which is it's imp an improvement over baseline, but over time we go back to baseline levels. And it's not until he gets feedback, remember what we did at the workshop, and here's what you did well that was like what we focused on on the workshop, and here's what you can improve, that we start to get an increase in the use of the effective practice. And that happens again. He wasn't doing it on the playground, a reminder or feedback, and that in increases. And that was the pattern for all the paraprofessionals, which is exactly what um, Dean Fixen and his colleagues talked about. We also thought about, well, we need to now take this into account in the development of our programs. And this is an example of our master's degree we have with um, a specialization in autism. So the students come in with a credential, and during their credential they are supervised by a, a teacher who has the same credential or is an expert in the practices of that field. And then we beefed up the supervision that they get in their master's program. We hired graduates to come back and be the mentors and had created a course for them so that they learned how to be a good supervisor. So we knew they had the skills because they were a graduate, but now they could be a good coach. And then we focused on taking them to field trips and learning about the fact that there's a large profession out there that can provide support for you. And then by the time they graduate after the, th after the three year program, they are also good supervisors of other people, paraprofessionals and their peers. And I've been um, researching the, the outcomes for these graduates. In other words, seeing what happens when they finish. They leave the program, they go out into the field. What is happening? This is a recent publication of the graduates from 2006 to see what are they doing. Um, there were 12 of them, they all responded. It was a multiple measures study. I've since done three others and the pattern is consistent that the graduates remain in the field, which means, um, which is a big deal because in special ed, the estimates is up to 43% leave the field within the first three to five years. It's a tough 
tough field out there. So they really need to be prepared. But these graduates are staying in the field, which means that the students with autism and their families are benefiting from that expertise. They also continue to collect data for progress monitoring purposes. I didn't see any when I first came to San Diego State out in the field. They're using evidence-based practices at high rates, and they attribute the program here as the reason why they develop the capacity to use the practices and to sustain them over time. Um, when asked specifically, what about the program helped you to sustain these effective practices, they reported just what we know from implementation science, that knowledge about these research-based practices, what they are and how to do them, and then practicing the skills with a coach during practicum experiences was what really made them feel confident and competent and remain in the field. And currently, I'm involved in a, in a project called the Center on Secondary Education for Students with Autism Spectrum Disorders. And we are working in high schools. But this is a professional development project. So we're working with the high school staff, teachers, speech and language pathologists, school psychologists, all of the personnel that work in high schools to, to help them better implement evidence-based practices with families, and with students and families. This was a multi-site project awarded by, to Sam Odom and Kara Hume at the University of North Carolina. And there are three sites involved in the project. We are um, the Waisman Center at the University of Wisconsin and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And we're all doing the same things in our three sites. We're implementing curriculum that was designed by national experts in the areas that are typically a challenge for individuals on the spectrum. So this is what um, the, the study design looks like. It's a randomized control trial study. The number of years that each school is involved is two years. So right now, we're, we have a team um, in the College of Ed. We have a CESA team. And we're in 20 high schools. So it's like spinning plates to find out what's happening in each of these high schools. 10 of them are randomly assigned to the full CESA intervention. And the others are a comparison. But they get some minimal intervention in that school. Um, so we're in 20 high schools. All together, we're going to have between 600 and 720 individuals with autism. And um, that will be the largest study uh, having of that population so far. These are the what we're actually doing in the high schools. So there's a reading curriculum because individuals have challenges with comprehension. They may read words, but not really fully understand what it is they're reading. Um, independence and behavior using evidence-based practices for self-management or to address challenging behavior. It's a social, relational dis disability. So they all have a peer-to-peer -peer network and a social competence intervention. And finally, there's a focus on transition. We know that work-based learning activities result in better outcomes. So we focus on that, have them direct their IEPs. And there's a transitioning together component for the families because um, that was designed at Wisconsin, in Wisconsin. Um, with this study, we have a battery of assessments that we give at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the two years, um, standardized tests that we, the students do. In fact, our students in school psychology are helping us out with that. Um, the teachers fill out a battery each time, and sort of the parents. In addition, and what makes this pro, uh, project uh, particularly interesting for me, is that we are also measuring all of these things that relate to the implementation of the project. In other words, um, all of our CESA coaches log the hours and the content of what they're coaching. Um, my colleague Bonnie Kramer and I watch them coach and do a fidelity checklist that they are skilled coaches. We also um, log all the training. Then all of the coaches log the fidelity of implementation for each of the components to say, yes, this teacher is doing it as designed. So we know clearly what, what, are, what is happening for each of the students on the spectrum. Um, we also do an overall APERS, which is a program evaluation for the school. Um, and then for the students, we, we um, make sure that the students are getting each and every intervention. And they fill out a rating form on their experience. Was this valuable to you? You participated in this project. How did you like the reading component? How did you like the work-based learning, et cetera? So we're getting their feedback. So we are going to learn an incredible amount in this project. Um, but the thing I'm most interested in is how we're getting the 10 schools and the staff in the high schools prepared and trained to use all of the, the curriculum and how we do that well because each school is so different so that we can continue with that kind of professional development. And I think I made my time. <laughs> Questions for Laura? <clears throat> oh, 
I just for me it was always interesting. Uh, why uh, autism now in focus? Because there are a lot of other deviations, but why uh, there are so many attentions to autism to this one? Is um, so I think that right now there is an, an increase in the, the identification and prevalence of individuals with autism spectrum disorders. Um, and there are varying theories about why that's the case. Better diagnosis, more awareness. Um, there also could be something else going on that we have so many more individuals with that classification. And much of the research has been done with in, when they're young because we know early intervention can make a difference, uh, but there's been very little in, in high schools. So the, the US government funded this grant to have a look at what's best, what could be best practices in high school. But, but Laura, fundamentally, this would even work with kids who had no issues, correct? Um, yes. <laughs> yes, because we're, t we're preparing the high school personnel to use evidence-based practices. So sir, it, yes. Sorry, this sort of falls onto that question. Yes. I guess as we pilot things in special education, the interventions start looking more and more just like good teaching. And similarly, as we you know train special education teachers, it starts to look just like good teacher training. I, I guess I'm interested if you have any um, comments on that sort of confluence and the things that are being observed and piloted in the special education realm and their relevance to just good teaching. Um, I'm, 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 I want to make sure I am answering your question. I'm not quite clear if you're, if you're asking about um, what, what do special educators do differently than um, teachers or is there something about these components that supplements the, the preparation for, for what would be effective teaching. So I, I, I think that there are certain things that underline it. So for example, in all the schools we're helping all teachers write very good goals that are observable and measurable. And I didn't even talk about the fact that we're measuring goal, two goal, four goals for each student over the two years. Um, that is good practice in special ed um, is to have clear goals of where they want to be and how to measure them. Um, but it takes, I think it takes more than we think as, as people that prepare them to have the outcome be that when all students graduate they're doing that job well. Because if you look at the way plans are written or IEPs are written, many are not, don't have very good goals. So that's just one example, but that is one thing we're focusing on with this project. So yes, we're focusing on things that in general will be good teachers, and then we're targeting like the peer-to-peer -peer networks and the social that has to do with more with autism, because you will have individuals with autism who will do very well academically and then sit at home with their diploma because they can't keep a job, they don't have a social network, or they have trouble negotiating uh, careers or positions for other reasons. So we're trying to target that. Um, how, what are the characteristics of, you know, the candidates to be good coach? Like, you know, the coach, from my understanding, is such a big part of it. What are the qualities of the good coach? Um, so the, the, the uh, project co-PIs, Sam Odom and Kara Hume, were involved in a, another center before called the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorders. And they created a coaching manual that I showed in one of my slides briefly. And they talked about what it means to be a good coach. And what, what it means to be a good coach, um, from, from even from implementation science, is having a good knowledge of, the, of the, what you want to teach. So if it's a particular practice, knowing that practice well, but then being able to model it and to have be able to give feedback to someone in a way that builds their confidence um, but is descriptive enough that they know what to do next time and have them practice. So a good coach would typically come out and um, have a pre-meeting with someone and say what do you want, let, what are we going to focus on this time, do a good observation and then provide feedback on that. So not so many different things that they feel um, um, disillusioned but give them a few specific uh, pieces of feedback about what they could do differently next time and then follow up with that specific feedback. I think we are about out of time. Okay. Um, can I ask one last question? Sure. Um, one of the things that you mentioned that was really striking was the percent people that stay in the field if they get this kind of training, which is a very important issue. Yes. 
What kind of numbers are you talking about? Is this a small group or have you okay? Looked at yeah. Large? Um, so so far, we have graduated about 130 to 150 students that have the the credential and the master's degree, um, and um, I believe many of them. Um, Mo that percentage, 94 to 100% stay in the field. And we try to stay connected with them um, and through surveys and find out what's going on. But through the different networks of each graduating group, we have a very strong cohort model. So if we don't know where, where somebody is, we might say, oh, have you heard from so-and-so? And, -so? and they'll, they'll share, oh, they moved out of state or I, this is where I know they are. Thank you very much. You're welcome.